Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome. My name is Nicholas Manousis. Uh, I'm the president of the Horological Society of New York, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our March meeting. I've got a, uh, a couple announcements first, uh, a couple uh, interesting things that I want to share with everyone. So first off, this book, uh, American Genius, 19th Century Bank Locks and Time Locks. Now, why am, why am I uh, showing you this book? Why am I bringing it up? Does anybody know? I did not, I did not write it. It was written by uh, David Errol and John Errol. And I'm bringing it up because uh, just, just up there is one of the uh, uh, world's most comprehensive and uh, complete collections of locks. So it's the John Mossman Lock Collection. It's on the mezzanine level here uh, in the library. And it's uh, part of the General Society, our, our hosts here uh, uh, for our, our monthly meetings. And the General Society has, has asked uh, and uh, kindly invited uh, all of the Horological Society members to, uh, to peruse the museum, uh, to check it out, uh, both before and after lectures. It's open. Uh, so you can just head on up the stairs to the mezzanine level and take a look. Uh, so it's, it's a collection of locks going back uh, to ancient Egypt to uh, up to modern times. But the, the, there's, I think, one or two cases that are very relevant to what we do, and those are the time locks. So they're, they're locks that were primarily used for bank vaults that contain mechanical watch movements in them. And the idea was that when you leave the bank on Friday night, you set the, the lock on the vault, and it cannot be opened until Monday morning. Uh, so very, very interesting. Uh, highly recommend everybody go upstairs and, and check them out uh, after tonight's lecture or uh, before, before or after uh, uh, any, any lecture coming up. So that's uh, something I wanted to share with everyone. And this book, this, uh, this wonderful book, uh, we're going to uh, make it available in our library. So if anybody would like to, to check it out, it's, uh, it'll be available in the HSNY library, which is housed just up there in the stacks. So American Genius and uh, the Mossman Lock Collection just upstairs. Okay. Uh, I know there's a few new members here, uh, and I passed out a couple lapel pins before the meeting. Uh, if there are any other new members that would like to pick up their lapel pins, you can see me after the meeting. I'd be happy to, uh, to give that to you, and thank you to all the new members that have been joining recently. Uh, we've got a, a full, full house tonight, and it's nice to see all these new faces. So traveling education. At the, uh, at the last meeting, I, I was talking a little bit about the upcoming classes. And uh, I'm now happy to, uh, to say that the classes uh, are over. We did them for four weekends consecutively. Uh, and this is a, a photo of uh, HSNY's director of traveling education, Vincent Robert. And he's teaching a class in Silicon Valley, California. Uh, this was actually uh, Sunday he was teaching. And Vincent is actually on a plane right now flying back to New York uh, from, from San Francisco. So th that was a very fun uh, four weekends of classes that we did. And we, we really want to say thanks to our hosts. So in Chicago, we were hosted by Oak and Oscar. In Philadelphia, by Pipeline Workspaces. Seattle was Youngstown Cultural Art Center. And Silicon Valley was uh, Stephen Silver Fine Jewelry. So we, we give our thanks to our, our hosts. They really make uh, this traveling education series possible. And uh, we're looking forward to continuing uh, these classes and taking them uh, to even more cities uh, later on this year. And also at the last meeting, I uh, was announcing the Henry B. Freed Scholarship. And uh, here's a photo of, of Mr. Freed. And I'm very happy to announce that uh, we received 20 applications. The, the application deadline is now closed, and the winner will be announced at the annual gala coming up uh, next month, April 3rd. So that's uh, a really nice response to the scholarship, and we're looking forward to, to continuing this every year. It's a, it's a, a great initiative for, for a great cause. So speaking of the gala, we have some, uh, some announcements about the gala, some, uh, some things going on. It's, uh, it's about that time of year, and I'd like to invite uh, our, our vice president up here, uh, Mr. Michael Foster, and he'll give an update. Thank you, Nick. Um, how do we get this work? 
Nice. Well, I was actually going to be giving the speech since we thought that uh, William wasn't going to make it tonight, so this is my consolation prize standing in front of you here today. Um, in regards to the gala, we announced it last time that we will be having it on April 3rd. For those of you ha who didn't attend last year's gala, it was an awesome event. We'll be showing you some pictures. And the most important part about the gala is that you could buy tickets starting now. It's on the website. They're um, sold through Eventbrite. So everybody get online, get your tickets. They are going to go fast. At the gala, we will be talking about the scholarship while well, we'll be presenting it, as Nick mentioned. Um, we'll also be doing a charity auction that will go to benefit an endowment fund. And of course, we'll have some dinner and drinks. If you don't like that, you don't have to partake, but it'll be available. That's basically the opening to the gala last year, the 150th. For those of you who don't know that guy, he will be there. You can meet him there. He should be speaking. It'll be good. And then there we are giving out the, um, Hans, uh, the Hans Weber Award. And this is where I give it up. Thank you, Mike. So I, th I think the projector is working. Sorry, it's kind of flashing in and out. I think it's good now. We just give it a minute. OK, tonight's lecture. Uh, I'm sure everyone has heard the, uh, the joke, when you go to an auction, be careful not to scratch your nose because the auctioneer is going to think you're bidding uh, on, on something at the auction. And w what is it about uh, watch auctions in particular that are, that are so interesting, that, are so re that makes them so relevant today? Uh, and I think it's because of the qualities that are present uh, in, in any watch auction. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of a unique uh, place, place to be because a watch auction is historical, it's mathematical, it's invigorating, and it's nerve-wracking all at the same time. And uh, tonight, we're going to get in depth on each of those topics. We're going we're to really talk about them in detail. So it uh, gives me a great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight. Uh, he's the managing director of timezone.com, and he's a trustee of the Horological Society of New York. Please join me in welcoming Mr. William Messina. Thank you. Mike is working. You can hear me? We had mic problems. Um, last month, we were very lucky. We had John Reardon. Is John in the room tonight? Oh, yes, I see you, John. Um, John has uh, made a great, great speech about a lot of people in the room. He didn't talk about himself, didn't talk about me. John, he didn't talk about me. Um, but I have a much bigger crowd today, much, much bigger. And I have no notes, unlike you. Um, and we're going to talk about John's world, the world of auction. Um, and as you can see, we're going to learn how to buy and sometimes to sell at auction. Uh, I kind of screwed up on the title. I want to call it How to Lose at Auction because I'm not a big auction buyer. I don't like buying at auction. Um, and the reason I don't like buying at auction is because I'm very Swiss. And auction is a world of a lot of irrationality. Everybody's irrational. The auctioneer is irrational. The buyer is irrational. But yet, this is where it's the most exciting for everybody. And, and to a guy like me, it's not really a place to buy a watch. But Sometimes I do buy a watch, and I've sold a few through auctions, and I've been an auctioneer, so I'm going to give, give you a behind the, uh, the curtain, and uh, hopefully you will enjoy it. Um, so these are the topics tonight. We're going to talk a bit about the history of auction, a history of watch auction, who are the players, um, how to buy at an auction, how to read a catalog. That's very important. I notice a lot of people don't know how to read a catalog. And over the years, it's very frustrating, especially for an auctioneer, when somebody asks you questions question not already on the catalog, or the, question, or the answers are, are very easy to find. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at the evolution of catalogs, how they were 10 years ago, how they are now. We are going to look at how to register for an auction, how to bid at an auction, um, and what to do after you bid something at an auction. 
So a lot to cover, uh, and hopefully we'll have some questions for me at the end. Um, brief history of auction. You have a uh, definition first of an auction right here. Any held sales in public where you find a buyer and a seller is an auction. Wall Street, the stock market is by definition an auction. Um, auctions are not the oldest way of buying and selling. Actually, people were doing bartering and, and then people had retail shops before there were auctions. The first auction is an auction of wives, believe it or not. They were selling wives. People would go and the auctioneer would dress up the woman and he would put her on the stand and they would put the most beautiful first and the ugliest last. Uh, a bit like watch dealers and watch auctioneers do today. They would put in the catalog the best one first to establish a price and then the ugliest watch later. Um, and, um, and that was the first trace we have in writing in Babylon of auctions. So the, the big thing is how did they go from pimping to becoming experts. Why makes an auctioneer an expert? Why are those guys, because they, they're selling something, like any dealer, are more of an expert than the other guy? Why go to an auctioneer, rather than go to a, a watch dealer, or even a, when you buy a painting, why go to an auctioneer, rather than go to a dealer? And, and that's what we're gonna explore. First, we're gonna look at uh, the history and the context of uh, the auction business. So. Auction was born in uh, the 1750s in the UK. Uh, and there's two reasons of that. The first is the United Kingdom, England, was the birth of the bourgeoisie, of the middle class. Um, there was no need really for auctioneers before this because the state were going from the oldest to the oldest son. So everything, a man will die, a noble man, a rich man will die and all his money will go to his first son, and the second son will become a priest, or the second son will go to war, or the second son will marry well, but the, there was no need for an estate. And, and with the rise of the middle class, with the rise of the bourgeoisie, they, there was a need for this. People suddenly were rich, they had, they had to split their estate, um, and um, they needed somebody to do that for them. And auctioneers came, people like Christie's, people like Sotheby's, were real people, they came and they were selling uh, those estate. So another thing happened in the late 19th century that was very important in the UK for auctioneers is the revolution in France. The French nobility left France and a lot of them went and seek exile in, in the United Kingdom. And they came with goods, they came with jewelry, they came with their furniture, and they sold this stuff in order to have money because they lost everything during the revolution. And this is where Christie's and Sotheby's and a few other, the Bonhams, all those guys, all those names that you hear today, um, started to have a real business. Uh, before that, it was a guy coming in a room, putting a night in the paper, and a couple of dealers would come, they would sell it, and that would be it. After the French Revolution, it became a real business. It was so much of a big business, and when Napoleon died in St. Helena, he had a fairly big uh, watch, li uh, sorry, book library, and, and a few watches, actually, and they sold that at Christie's um, in, in 1823. Um, from basically 1750 to 1950, that was the business of auction. After the Second World War, things changed. And they, there was so much competition in the United Kingdom that they decided that they had to expand, that their business model was good for the rest of the world. There was not really an auction business in Europe, and Christie's was the first company to open an office to do auctions in Western Europe after the war, and that was in Geneva. And I bet a few people, very few people know that. I learned this this weekend. Uh, Christie's opened an auction room in Geneva in 1958. They had a rep in, in Rome in 1954, but before that, Christie's had nothing. Sotheby's did a different way of expanding. They bought a company in New York called Park Bennett. Uh, and Park Bennett was the biggest auctioneer. Actually, the pictures you see here are Park Bennett in New York. And they bought it, they changed the name to Sotheby's 10 or 15 years later, and that's the way they expanded. Other companies did that, Bonhams, uh, bought Butterfields from eBay about 20 years ago, actually more like 17, and, and they, they gave it his name, and, and the name Bonhams, and, and now they, have, uh, or they had offices in California. So for about 30 years, the expansion and, and bringing more revenue was to, to try to seek new, new buyers, but those buyers were mostly dealers. 
you will have sophisticated bios coming. Why? Because it was easy. Guys will come, you have very little description, you will just show a table and you have a few dealers fighting for a table, fighting for a clock, and you'll be done. And, you'll, and you'll, uh, your overheads were low. Um, but something happened uh, in, in the 1980s that changed everything. And that is the Van Gogh, the Tournesol Van Gogh and the Japanese. The Japanese completely changed upside down the, the auction business. Because the Japanese were private individuals, they were private collectors. And, and the auction house dealing with the Japanese realized that they had, those guys were looking up at them as these guys are experts. These guys just sold a Van Gogh for 40 million. This is the, uh, the, the Sunflowers that was a world record in 1987 uh, in London. It did 39.9 million. And, and this is a big turnaround. The press start talking about it. Oh, look, they sold this painting at, at an auction. And, and, and Christie's and also Sotheby's, they realized that they could use this as advertising, as bring more, um, more uh, goods to sell, and at the same time, advertise for more buyers. So they started to cultivate that, uh, that idea of having um, an expert. You talk to somebody who sold a big painting for 40 million, so therefore he must be, he must be an expert in something. He must know what he's doing. Um, and, and that was kind of the, the, the promotion and the marketing that the, the big auction houses had. And it was very, very successful. Um, uh, and, and, and this is where we are today. Today, people look up at, uh, auctioneers in, in all the fields, mostly all the fields, whether it's cars, whether it's furniture, it's paintings or watches, as experts, because they've sold the most expensive and they've touched the, the biggest and the rarest um, goods that there are. And, 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 and the auction house continue to do this. They, they, they enforce this and it's a culture within our, our auction house. They, 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 they want to promote those individuals somewhat as stars within a stable in order to bring more goods and bring more clients. Um, so tonight we're gonna to focus on watches. Obviously you guys are here for this. Uh, we're not gonna talk about eBay. We're not gonna talk about um, um, government auctions, uh, you know, when they seize goods and then sell them. Uh, there's a great video on National Geographic where you see me buying a watch from Madoff, by the way. Um, but we're not gonna talk about this today. We're gonna to talk about the, the major players in the watch world. Uh, who they are, how did they get there, and uh, where do they stand today? So you have the, I call the international players. There is Anticorum, uh, who's maybe the oldest. They were founded in 1974. You have Christie's. Christie's uh, was doing watch shows and selling clocks, but they didn't have a watch department until the 1980s. You have Sotheby's, who basically were at the same time as Christie's. Sotheby's, Christie's, they kind of look at each other. It's Coca-Cola, Pepsi. Uh, Christie's is red, so it's Coca-Cola. Uh, Sotheby's is blue, it's Pepsi. Christie's thinks globally, act locally, so it's kind of Coca-Cola. Pepsi, it's like Sotheby's are strong in the US. You, you basically get, but it's basically the same flavor. Uh, and they watch each other, and, and they look at each other, and actually there was a big scandal 20 years ago about this. Um, there's there were collusion 20 years ago, but basically when Christie's did the move, Sotheby's followed, or when Sotheby's did the move, Christie's followed. Uh, and last but not least, you have Philips, who about two years ago um, went into a partnership with Bax and Russo, Aurel Bax and his wife, Livia, to, uh, to create a, a watch department. Aurel used, used to be at Christie's. Um, another thing about Philips is they started a watch department in 2001, in December of 2001, with Aurel, and it lasted about a year. Uh, and and it, was, uh, it was a small and short experience for them, but it was an interesting experience. So these are the big guys. And then you have the regional players. You have Barnum's in London. Oh, by the way, difference between international players and the regional players is very simple. If you don't have an auction in Geneva, you're not an international player. Um, you can be a large regional player. You need at least to have an auction in Geneva and at least in New York or, uh, or Hong Kong. Um, of all the guys I mentioned, Oli Phillips doesn't have sales in New York. Regional players can be big. You have Barnum's. Barnum's has a fairly big business in the UK. They have a, a rather tiny business in New York. They used to have a business in Hong Kong. They closed. Um, auctioning uh, Quote, Dr. Quote, is a fairly big business in Germany. They do two auctions a year. If you look at the catalog, it's like 800 lots. It's uh, 
it's one of my favorite catalog. I always learn something. They sell a lot of clocks. They sell a lot of pocket watches. It's gathered to a German clientele. You often see watches in those catalogs that you will see later in the other big guys catalogs. Um, and Dr. Kroat has is owned by a guy called Stefan Muser, and they have two sales a year. Uh, a week before the big sales in Geneva. So the week before uh, May and the week before November in, uh, next to the airport in Frankfurt. Then you have Ar Arcurial. Arcurial is an is a offshot of Drouot. Drouot is a French auction house. And three or four players, uh, in, in, I think I put the name below, Brice, Poulain, and, uh, and Tajon uh, created a company. And they sell cars, and they sell watches, and they sell a few other things. They're based in Paris, but they sell in Monaco uh, because there's no VAT in Monaco. Uh, Monaco is kind of a Hong Kong in Europe. And it's kind of easy to do business. There's no legislation concerning um, auction. And Paris is a huge. Uh, legislation place, it's very difficult to, to, to make an auction in Paris. Um, now you have the niche players. You have Heritage, which is uh, a sponsor of this uh, great institution. But they're doing pretty well, actually. I, they did about a, a million and a half. They did two million in 2014, uh, more than two million. They did a little bit less than two million in 2015. Uh, a little bit less in 2016, but they're, they're players. Fellows in Birmingham, I like them. For some reason, I always think they turn up with one or two nice watch. Uh, but these are really niche players. They're local. They, they will dig a watch for you. And you have Watch of Nightbridge. Watch of Nightbridge is um, a great place if you have never bid for a watch because um, you can still buy a watch for a thousand bucks there, and uh, it's kind of hard to buy a watch for a thousand dollar at Christie's or Sotheby's. So if you're kind of scared of buying a watch uh, in the big league, you can always try a watch of uh, Nightbridge. And, and they're fairly nice guys. I've dealt with them, and, and I, I will recommend you to look at the watch, uh, you to go maybe uh, attend an auction in London, but it's a fairly good company. Uh, this graph gives you an idea of the evolution of the market in the last 20 years. In blue, you have Anticorum. In uh, green, you have Sotheby's. In red is Christie's. And uh, Philips is in purple. I don't know if it shows. Yeah, it does show in purple. Uh, so roughly, to give you an idea here, you can see that most of the business 20 years ago was Anticorum and uh, Sotheby's. Sotheby's sold an important watch 20 years ago. They sold, well, a little bit less, but they sold the Grave. And, and they already had a, a, a decent business in the 1990s, and Christie's was a very tiny player. I remember going to Christie's on Park Avenue, and they were, they were having $2 million watch collections. It was, it was very tiny, um, and Sotheby's and Anticorum were basically um, the, the business back then. Things got fairly big for Anticorum in 2002. They were selling, they sold big collection. They had, uh, uh, the, the, the chairman of HSBC had a huge watch collection. They sold that that year, and that explains the numbers. Uh, Osvaldo Patrizzi, who founded Anticorum, was uh, doing a lot of business, promoting watches everywhere. And, and what he brought to the business is something that is important to us today is he's the first one to realize that writing about watches was important. Scholarship work was important. Uh, he would publish books. He would uh, write footnotes. We're going to go into that later about footnotes. And he will try to innovate every time. Um, Anticrom started to have a decline in the late 2000s. Um, uh, and Oral backs at Christie's kind of took the mantle. And all of a sudden, you have even more scholarship being written. You have big catalogs coming, big watchers. And Christie's, as you can see, from about 2008 to 2015, 2014, was doing a, a sizable business at the expense of uh, Anticorum. Sotheby's was rather stable. Um, they were real leaders. They were the guys who sold the grave. And, and I think they ride that wave for a very long time. Um, and they're still riding that wave somewhat. Um, and they are there. They, they're still a player. They still have market share, as you can see. Um, but in, about two years ago, uh, Bax, Aurel Bax, moved from Christie's and went in a partnership with Philips to open uh, Philips and Bax and Russo. Um, and you can see it's the last two on, on, on your right. It's the uh, purple one. You can see that this had crushing effect on the industry. Um, it, it did increase the pie a bit, 
And, and keep in mind that this is after the Jap Chinese stopped buying so many watches, yet they were able to, to increase, and they not only increased the, the whole pie, they obviously took market shares from uh, Christie's and Sotheby's. Mostly Sotheby's, interestingly enough, more than Christie's in terms of numbers. I'm not gonna go a detail uh, lecture because I could, I could spend a whole three hours just on that graph. Um, but we're gonna look at a couple of other things about those guys. What's interesting though is that if you look at uh, overall at the whole business, it's about $275 million. That's about six months of the largest watch store in the world which is basically around the corner from here. Uh, the Apple store on 57 and 5th, they are doing about $600 million business a year. Yet you don't see a picture of the guy who managed that place anywhere. Uh, so keep this in perspective, it's tiny numbers. Uh, the business that uh, Heritage does is about half a day for uh, the Apple store on 57th Street and 5th. Uh, just to give you some perspective here. So we're gonna look a bit at the auction market today. We're gonna look at some stats that I think are relevant for you to understand better how to interact with an, uh, an auctioneer or an auction company. Uh, first is where is the money? Who does what where and who is big where? Um, you see that um, in, uh, in New York, it's still a Sotheby's business, even though Christie's is kind of taking market shares. By the way, uh, I spent the whole weekend looking at those numbers because I know there's a few of the auction people in the room today and I didn't want to upset anybody. I didn't want to give wrong numbers. So I put rough numbers in purpose. Uh, but I'm, I'm I know I'm basically there. Uh, I double check the numbers. So don't come and say I'm $100,000 less or $100,000 more because I know that and the, the Swiss francs and I didn't took the right rate. But more or less, I think my numbers are right. And if you don't think so, you can always talk to me at the end. Um, so look at the numbers for uh, New York. You see that Sotheby's is the leader. Christie's is um, now the leader in Hong Kong, which was not the case two years ago. In two years ago, Sotheby's was the leader. And this is why Christie's is uh, doing a very good job in Hong Kong. Um, and obviously in Geneva, Philips is crushing it. In both places, actually. If you look at it, Philips with only four auctions a year is crushing the other guys who have sometimes eight auctions. I mean, Anticom, I think, has nine. Uh, miscellaneous is London and Dubai. Christie's has two sales in uh, Dubai, and Sotheby's has three sales in London. Uh, the rather small sales in London, are usually a, a somebody's collection, but they do a sizable business, and I included that there. Um, Philips has uh, thematic auctions, but I, I consider them one auction. So one season, one day, they may do two auctions, but I consider that one, uh, one auction. You notice how in, in two years, Philips is kind of crushing the business. It's, um, I, to, to a watch, to a, an auction guy, it's kind of like you have a new franchise, you take the best players, and, and all of a sudden you're crushing the entire business. Um, it's, it's very interesting. Now, what if this means to you? It means who, where do you go, where maybe you can put a watch, uh, who is the big guy, who talks the big game in which city? Um, and, and that kind of gives you an idea. Now, average price per lot, and this is why it's important for you guys, is when I was in the auction business, guys show up with a $5,000 watch and he thinks I'm gonna kiss his feet and beg him to take his watch. And this kind of gives you an idea of where the business is. If you don't have a $120,000 watch at Philips, and you wanna put it in Geneva? Well, guys, I'm sorry, but this is not gonna go far away. Um, and, and this is a huge number. When, first, when I put the Philips number, I thought I had, in my spreadsheet, I had totaled the Geneva, Christine, and Sotheby's together. Uh, it, it's absolutely outstanding how big Philips is here. Uh, even in Hong Kong, they're huge. They're twice as big as Christie's, who is the biggest business in Hong Kong. Um, Sotheby's has uh, dropped, I, I did a historical on this just for fun. They, they, they kind of dropped in their um, average, but Philips is bringing everybody else's average up. And obviously this can be useful for you guys if you're looking to sell a watch, 
Well, if you have a $10,000 watch and you think it's good to go in Geneva, you can definitely go to Anticom. I think you have a better service than if you go to a Philips where there's a $120,000 business. Keep that in mind. Don't always think that he has to be the best player. He has to be the, the big shot because the big shot may not be interested in your watch at all. Where the smaller guy may be more interested in your watch if he fits more within the profile of their auction. So this brings us to how to sell a watch. And I think this is uh, something I'm not going to go a lot uh, on because it's really your mileage may vary. A lot of the auction house have different ways of dealing. I, I'm not experienced with every auction house. I think that uh, it's your relationship with the auctioneer is more important on the selling than on the buying. Uh, auctioneers need uh, to create a, a relationship with their clients. And, and I want you to, to remember this is, the auctioneer works for the seller. He doesn't work for the buyer. Um, this is why Sotheby's and Christie's have real estate or real estate brokers. I don't know if you guys know. And real estate brokers work for the seller. They don't work for the broker, for the for the buyer. They're friends with the buyer. They hang out with the buyer all day long. But they get the commission. They get paid by the the seller. And in the case of uh, auction, is different. You are paying them through a premium. But the seller is also paying them a commission. And they know that they can go back to the seller who will give them another watch. And they also know that you may think that they did a good job with you, and you may give them another watch. So the relationship is a little bit more um, in between. But in the case of a specific watch you want to buy from them, they're working for the seller. The knack of consigning. First, is fresh to the market. That's the thing that every good auctioneer will tell you. They want fresh to the market thing. If you bring them a watch that has been there five times already at auction, you're going to have a big May. And I'm going to explain to you why they're not so happy about non-fresh to the market watches later. Um, collectors are better than dealers because dealers don't bring fresh to the market goods. Dealers have tried to sell those watches to their clients, and they couldn't, so they're giving them to an auctioneer. So auctioneers know that a lot of the people that buy from them already seen that watch. Fresh of the market stuff is stuff that's never been seen before. Exciting stuff, new stuff, stuff you can write about. Um, the contract. So when you sell a watch, you get a contract. Read that contract. When I worked in the auction business, I noticed how many sellers don't read the contract. I know it's a pain in the neck, but you have to read the freaking contract. Um, the bait or the reserve. The reserve is the minimum price that a watch will sell. By definition, auctioneers want the least amount of money. And the reason is very simple. They want to sell the watch. They don't want to wait. They don't want to put it again for sale. They want to sell that thing. They want to move it. Um, and, and they know, and that's important, they know that the lower the reserve, the lower the estimate, the more it's a bait. The more people are going to be intrigued and excited about that watch. The more people will come and think about bidding on that watch. So it's kind of a fight between the seller who paid the price for the watch and the, and the auction house who wants to put a lower reserve. My recommendation, listen to the auctioneer here. The auctioneer doesn't want to look stupid, so he's not going to make a really dumb move. He doesn't want to be known as the guy who sold that amazing Patek for little money. But he knows how to bait his buyers. He knows where he is. And this is where you should listen to the auctioneer here. On the, uh, the estimate, usually the estimate, which is the next one, the guess, the low estimate is the reserve. So it gives you, the buyer, an idea of where the reserve stands. It's not always the reserve, but it's often the reserve. And again, the auctioneer doesn't want to look like an idiot when he puts an estimate. He wants it low, but he doesn't want to look that low that he looks like he doesn't know what he's doing. Commission and fees. Now, this is a tough one. Commission can vary between 10, 15, 0 percent. It really depends what you have, what you bring. Uh, fees can be different fees. Insurance fees, your watch insured. Um, photograph fees. Um, uh, transportation fees. There's a few fees, and, and this really depends how big the goods are. They work on margins. You know, it's a margin business. They put your watch in a magazine, that costs money. A page in a magazine to print costs money. To ship to your client costs money. And this you have to keep in mind um, when you negotiate with the, uh, with the auctioneer. But you should always negotiate. Don't take a first number. Negotiate. Getting paid. Um, the auctioneer is a middleman. The auctioneer takes payments and gives it to you. They don't pay you and then go try to find a payment for you. You won't get paid until they are paid. Uh, and hopefully you'll pay within 30 days. 
how to buy. So we're basically done with consigning. There's, there's much more to talk about, but again, you're better off talking to a few auction house and see what they, they offer you than to get two or three advice for somebody like me. Um, the most important part of buying a watch at auction is the catalog. It's amazing how many people don't read contracts and how many people don't read catalogs. Actually, if you read all the catalogs, you'd be the expert, uh, not the auctioneer. Um, you have the, I put the catalogs of all auctions, uh, the four major here. Um, and I want to go over the evolution of a catalog with you, tell you what is what. Um, is there a laser on this? Oh, perfect. Um, this is the art of Patek Philippe from Asbok Feldman. Asbok Feldman was a fancy name for anti. Everybody okay? Um, Asbok Feldman was a fancy name for Anticoam um, for a few years. They thought that it would look more uh, interesting than Anticoam, so they used that name. Um, this is the famous thematic auction of Patek Philippe. This is kind of like the mother of all auction. It was the first um, uh, wristwatch auction. It, was, uh, it kind of launched the, the renewal of interest in wristwatches. Uh, and it was done by Anticoam for the 150th anniversary of Patek Philippe. You'll notice here, uh, this is uh, this watch, which is a 1518. So this watch share a page with the 2497 that is there. Um, this is in Japanese, because as you remember, I told you Japanese were big buyers at the time. So they were doing Japanese. Here on top, you have a description of the watch. And then you have kind of a description. This is called a description right there. Uh, it tells you what color the case is, what kind of movement it is, the, num the reference of the movement. And there here below, you have the estimate. Um, yes, that's the estimate. And, and then right there, this line right here is a footnote. The footnote here is reference to Patek Philippe, a book and a page. And that's it, that's the footnote. This is the way they were selling watches in the most important watch auction in the 1980s. This is like the mother of all auction. This is like the auction. When I got that catalog, I thought, that's it, I was gonna learn a lot about watches with this thing. Uh, I don't speak Japanese. But this was it. Uh, 10 years later, Anticom did another one. In 1999, Anticom did another one, The Art of Patek Philippe. They did another um, a big sale. This time they, they didn't put a Cali 9, they put something else. Uh, and you can see that things are changing a lot. Still a 1518. Oh, by the way, the last one sold for 275,000. This one, 10 years later, sold for 225. Remember last year, uh, watches as investment? Okay. Um, this is where they put a little ad right there. Now you have a little bit thicker description. Now you have a little condition report right there where they tell you how nice the case is. I know you guys cannot read this, but, uh, and right here, right this, this is a new footnote. And the footnote here tells you how many of those watches were made. It tells you, well, uh, they made 200 something, 1518, uh, in this color and that color, and that's it. That's it, you're buying a $250,000 watch, and there's this little footnote. Now, no out of Patek Philippe for another 15 years, six, 15 years. And then comes Christie's in 2014, and Christie's does, not a footnote, Christie's has four pages. Now, I mean, now we're talking scholarship here. Those guys evolved. They know they want to sell you that watch. Uh, first page is about the owner of the watch, the provenance. That watch belonged to King Farouk of Egypt. Um, right here, this is the description of the watch. This is basically the same thing you see everywhere. This is a copy of the extract of the archives. A picture of the watch here, a picture of the watch here, a picture of the owner here, a picture of the watch here, back of the watch. Uh, and, uh, this is a picture of the catalog of the watch and a huge description about the watch. How great that watch is, how amazing of a watch it is, how great of a condition the watch is. So you can see right here how much it evolved. Now, um, in 15 years, the business really, really changed. The, 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 the importance here for you to remember is what to read when you read the catalog. Do you have time to read an entire catalog? Do you have even a time to read the watch you're going to buy? Yes, you do. You need to read that. Um, but if you have to read only one part, forget this. This is not important. You want to write this. You want to write your own footnote. You don't want to read the auctioneer footnote. If you need to read the auctioneer footnote when you buy this watch, you're not buying this watch. You don't get it. You are basically not doing your homework. You should be able to write your old footnote and not read this. You read this, 
This is important. This tells you what watch you're buying. It can tell you the color. It tells you that it has right there an extract of the archives. But the footnote, you forget the footnote. The footnote is the marketing of the watch. We're going to go over the footnote for a while. And there's something else you need to have. Um, oh, you reversed something. OK, so this is, uh, we, we, this is the, um, the same watch, the, the Farouk watch. But this is on a bracelet. This is um, uh, Anticorum sold that watch in 2000. And it was to give you an idea of how it looks. You see, they put the uh, same watch as the last one we just saw. They did four page. This is taken from the database. So I don't have the, the picture of the catalog. Uh, but it shows you how big the footnote is here. It tells you all about how great that Farouk watch is. Uh, there's a picture. I think they also had a picture of Farouk. But basically, it tells you that they were increasing, they were making bigger footnotes. They wanted to educate you to buy the watch. Uh, obviously, more important is the watch, the longer the footnote. Um, now, this is a very important piece of paper that you guys should always ask when you buy a watch. Whether it's a quarter million dollar watch or whether it's a thousand dollar watch, you want a condition report. That piece of paper is not in the catalog. And very few beginners know that this exists. Condition report is the auctioneer telling you how the watch is working. Is it polished? Is, it, uh, is, is the chronograph working? Is it giving correct time? The condition report is basically the state of health of the watch. Now, if you think that the watch went through a thorough inspection, you have to keep in mind that they're looking at 600 watches. So basically, the specialist, when he did the description, he kind of quickly looked made sure that things were working properly, that it was giving good time, just to write this condition report. But he didn't do a thorough inspection of the, of the condition report. Yet, he did one, and you should read it, and you should ask for it. And if you go to a preview, you can ask to see the condition report, and the auctioneer will give you the condition report. Any decent auctioneer has a condition report, and if they don't have it there, they will email you a condition report. Some write condition report for every watch, others just for the one you request. You can email and ask for a condition report. Christie's has, uh, and Sotheby's, you can just go online and you can pull the condition report online, uh, which is very useful. Uh, and this is important, condition report. So description and condition report. And obviously, you have to go see the watch. Seeing the watch is much more important than any of this stuff. You have to see the watch. You have to touch the watch. Um, you have to see the watch. That's the number one thing. I want to go through with you um, about something where I, how an auction sells the same watch three times over, th let's say, five years. So I have examples of watches that have been sold three times over the last five years and how different the description is. And I brought this stuff and I realized that I was going to have to wear a bulletproof jacket for the rest of my life. <laughs> so I decided that I was going to. Um, not hurt anybody, and I was going to use horses. Using a horse is great because, first of all, horses have about the same value as a watch. The world record for a horse is $13 million at auction. Horses have, uh, have breeds, they have color, and uh, we can learn a lot about horse auction and watch auction. So we're going to use a horse to make my point. So bear with me. And you will see the exercise is worth it. Uh, and you will always remember the horse at the end of this lecture. You forget everything else, but you remember the horse. I promise you that. This is a horse. He's two years old. He's American. He's a beautiful horse. He's bay color. Uh, bay is a fairly common color. Uh, he sells within the estimate, 60 to 100,000. That's about the average price of a horse in America at auction today. They sell for about 70 grand. Um, you have, uh, again, here you have the uh, description of the horse. You have the color, the age, and the footnote. And as you can see, the footnote tells you a lot of things about a horse, but not this one in particular, because this is just another horse. Um, it tells you, though, that if Palominos, white horses, are the rarest horse in the world, it's just to teach you something about a horse. This is about 99% of the watches out there. Give you a little footnote, we tell you what it is, and here's your, here's your watch. Or oh, here's your horse. Now, you buy that horse. And then you do your homework. You go on the internet. You look at the horse. And you realize that you didn't buy any horse. You bought American Pharaoh. I mean, <laughs> shit. You got the mother load right here, right? Um, 
So what do you do? You go to Christie's and you say, hey, or, or, or you can go to Philips, or you can go to Sotheby's, or even Barnum's. But you go and you decide that you want to sell that horse at auction. You want to make your eight million. You want to multiply your money by a uh, hundred times. So you go to the auctioneer and the auctioneer promotes your horse, puts the name, really sexy picture, and no more just a you know, boring picture of a horse. This is American Pharaoh winning the Triple Crown and it gives you everything about the horse. It tells you, uh, you have again a description of the horse, but now you have provenance. He's the son of Pioneer of the Nile, and Pioneer of the Nile finished second at the Kentucky Derby. And he tell you everything about his style career and his racing career and his pedigree. And he will tell you that it's the most important horse of the last 100 years. And he will sell you the horse. And this is great, and you're happy. And, and you, so now one of you guys in the room just bought American Fowl. And you know, American Fowl is now retired, and American Fowl kind of cost you money with the insurance, and you decide that you want to consign American Fowl again. But now, the problem is you bought American Fowl two years ago. American Fowl is the horse of all horses. So you go to another auctioneer, and you tell this auctioneer, can you promote it? And the auctioneer says, absolutely. I will promote that horse for you. I will do a catalog and sell that horse for you. So what's the catalog going to look like? Simple. <laughs> American Pharaoh became a unicorn. You give a nickname to the, to the horse. The horse is no more a horse. It's a unicorn. And you basically, I mean, you're laughing, but you have watches like this. You have, I could have done this with a watch, showing you over a 10-year period, the watch being a nothing, then the watch selling for something big, and then the watch being the unicorn of all watches. It's like, and I could have done this five times over. I didn't want to do this because I didn't want to hurt people's feeling in the room tonight or anywhere on the internet. But yes, this stuff exists. The unicorn of all horses exists. I've seen catalog with five unicorns. I've seen catalog where they go over the thing. It's laughable. It's, it's a joke. When you know where the watch was five years ago and you read this stuff, and this is why I want you guys to, to remember that, is that don't buy the hype. You know, the, um, the property of Elton J. I mean, you, you get it. You know, like some famous singer owned that horse. Wow, it makes it really expensive. Um, the, 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 the estimates, and, and you have people that buy this stuff. You have people that really believe this and will buy this, uh, this unicorn for, I don't know, a billion dollar or whatever, Trump money, whatever. Um, and that is something I want you to remember. The little horse in three auctions becomes a unicorn. Um, oh, of course, the, the, you, the, the thing is that uh, you, you'd be skeptical about the unicorn, but then social media go over the unicorn. It's like you have every guy in the world telling you how great that unicorn is in Geneva, how they were with the unicorn, and you see that unicorn over and over for the next three weeks. And of course, that will emphasize to you that that horse is really a unicorn. Don't buy into this. Really don't buy into the hype. And even you're looking at this and you're thinking it's only the big watchers, you'd be surprised. It's also the small watchers. It's not only the big watchers today. Um, so the conclusion of this is block the hype and the insanity. Try to, try to focus on what you want to buy, whether it's a big or a small watch. Be a skeptic. Is it really that important, that watch? Was there not another watch that was more important than this watch before? Um, View the watch, ask for condition report, ask questions. Auctioneers like it when you ask questions. They're there for that. Uh, do your homework. That's the most important thing when you buy a watch. Do your homework. Um, ah, come up with a maximum price you want to pay. That's the hardest part because obviously it's an auction and the bids and it goes left and right. Um, I usually come with a maximum price and if I think the bid is not going to go in my favor, meaning somebody else in the room or the auctioneer is going to take the bid, I scream my bid. So let's say if my maximum bid is 10,000 and somebody in the room took eight and the next bid is nine, but if somebody, take, or somebody took nine and somebody else took 10, I will scream it before. So you scream your maximum numbers at the end and the auctioneer may take it and that may be the end of it. And you may actually scare people away. Uh, that works. The Chinese love doing this. Um, so stick to the watch you, and stick to the watch you viewed. There's one thing at auction is people come in, they want to buy a watch and they get out and they bought something completely different. It happens to me every time, by the way. Um, but you should not do what I do. 
uh, or you be the loser side, you know, be on the winning side. Uh, you should be disciplined. Discipline at the auction is very important. Think discipline. Uh, during the auction, register and come early. Don't show up at the last minute like I did today. Come early. Um, now the bidding process, this is a question a lot of people ask me, and attending versus phone versus internet versus written bid, and I put basically the order I like. I like attending because you have a mood of the room. You can scream uh, a bid if you have to. You can uh, preview the watch at the last minute again if you have questions. You can, um, you, you can do a lot of things. You can talk to other people, see your friends, ask if they looked at the watch. Uh, phone is good second because you can talk to somebody from the company if you have questions on the phone, even if you're far, far away about shipping, about uh, if they saw the watch. Internet is third. Uh, I prefer the phone to the internet because of the bidding increments. Sometimes on the internet you're stuck with certain bidding increments. Written bid is the worst. A lot of people like written bid saying this is the most disciplined way of doing things. It's not. Because you basically give the auctioneer, and I have an auction license, and I've done auctions in New York and in Geneva, and I can tell you that we have an auction bid. We know what's the highest bid. So what's our job? Our job is to bring you guys to the biggest bid. And then my job is to try to bid what's on the piece of paper. So you are basically giving the auctioneer a way to push the envelope to your bid. That's the one I recommend the least, written bids. Uh, even though some people love them, but I, I don't recommend them. Etiquette, that's a thing I don't understand at auction. And don't feed the animals. Don't talk to the dealers. Dealers are not your friend at auction. They're all in the back. They talk among themselves. Don't feed them. Don't give them information. They're going to run all over you. Dealers are not your friends at an auction. Um, and don't bother the auction staff. Now, this is something that I noticed, and especially in the last two years, is people come and they rush at the auction staff like they're their old friends. This is the biggest day of the year for those guys. They sell watches two days a year. And you come and you start shit chatting say hello, be polite, but don't bother them with questions. And they have all their business in front of the table. They're going to call their clients. They have to think of 20 things. Don't bother those guys. I notice that a lot of young buyers go and talk to the uh, auction staff as if they were at Bloomingdale's and they were buying a pair of gloves. You're not at Bloomingdale's. You can ask questions after the auction. You can ask a lot of questions before the auction. But during the auction, let those guys work. Don't bother them. Um, prepare a bidding spreadsheet. I do this. Um, what I do is I, I do a spreadsheet where, especially when I'm in the UK or in countries where I'm not so familiar with the currency, I do a spreadsheet where I put the, um, the, uh, the hammer price increments and the premium and the conversion rate. So I can see exactly where I am. I don't need to wait five minutes before making my bid. If I know where I am, where exactly the watch will cost me, I can raise and be faster than the guy who's going to think 10 minutes. And the frustrated auctioneer will love you for this. He will come back to you. He will appreciate that you're, taking fast, um, you're making fast um, choices. And it would be good for you, too, because you don't have to think numbers and panicking over if you should buy the watch or not. You can do the spreadsheet. There's an auction uh, calculator app, which I'm very surprised nobody mentions anywhere, which is called Hammer and Premium. And you just put which auction you are in which country, and it will basically do everything for you. It's, uh, it's free, by the way, uh, Hammer and Premium. Uh, it's an iPhone app. Post-auction. BIs. BIs is an auctioneer term. It means for stuff that wasn't sold. And it means you can go and you can buy those uh, BIs. You can go and talk to the auctioneer after the auction and ask them, can I buy this? Um, and, and usually people have this conceived idea that they can buy one increment above what the auctioneer talk mentioned at during the auction. It doesn't work that way. You go to the auctioneer and say, I'm interested in that watch, and you make a bid for it. And the auctioneer will come back to you and say, well, my client doesn't want to do this, but we could go there. He will help you and guide you. The auctioneer wants to sell the watch. For him, it's dead. It's like that sale is dead. So if he sells the watch before he returns it to the owner, he wants to sell the watch. So you can go and talk to those guys. And they're open to talk. Um, paying or the art of settling your bills. Don't wait two years to pay your watches. Um, you're laughing, but do, people do wait two years to pay their watches. You, if you are really a serious seller or a serious buyer, you want to realize that what you're doing to, uh, 
when you buy a watch, it's basically what somebody could do to you. If you sell a watch, you want to get paid fast. And the auctioneer will sell the watch for you and pay as soon as 30 days after they have uh, the, the end of the auction if they've been paid fast. And you want this for you, and you want the guy who uh, uh, sold your watch to be paid fast. And, and it's, it's also good for the auctioneer because auctioneers like to know that their customers are good payers. They will rather sell you the watch than sell to a guy that is going to sell them in three or four years. Uh, caveat emptor, that's something that auctioneers uh, don't tell you, but that's something I will tell you today. Basically, the hammer tells you that the property went from this owner to you. And from that moment, you're kind of the owner of that watch. Can you go back and return the watch like you're at Barney's? Not really. Um, but if something is really wrong with the watch, if the watch is a fake, if the watch was um, uh, not as described, you may have a, a reason to uh, talk to the auctioneer. They're reasonable people, um, and, and they will talk to you. Sometimes stuff gets um, uh, broken during transportation. There's insurance for this. But usually, uh, you have to be careful with uh, auction, and this is why a lot of people prefer to buy with the dealer, is that it's caveat emptor when you buy a watch from those guys. Um, and last is the future watch auction. Where are they going today? Um, and, and what do auctioneers will do in the next 20 years? Obviously, it's a guessing game, but we can see already that it's kind of a, and especially with Philips entering the business, we can see that it's kind of a two-tier uh, auction business, where you can see with Christie's doing more and more um, online auctions that they want to keep the high-end stuff for life and pushing the small things for, um, uh, for the internet. Auctionata went out of business, and, and a lot of people thought that the business model was dead. I don't think the business model is dead. I, I think there is a lot to be done. I think that uh, we, we're still a long way because mostly of payment, and, and also the complexity for a lot of people to understand how to buy a, 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 an auction and on the internet. But I think this is where we're going, where the high-end stuff will always sell live, and where the lower end stuff will sell with the seal of approval of a high uh, important auction house. Uh, using technology to lower barriers of entries, this is where eBay, uh, for many years people thought it was going to be an eBay uh, type of business. I think eBay um, uh, is not the right business. The, the, the C2C is not very good for the simple reason that you, you need somewhere in between uh, an expert to, to to make an assessment about the quality and um, the, uh, can, some kind of guarantee about the watch. Uh, and this is where more and more of the auction business is going towards private treaties. Um, private treaty is a term in the business where the watch was not sold at an auction. It was sold privately with, between two sellers. And Sotheby's Christie's will sell that watch uh, in behalf of the seller privately without going through the auction business. And this is becoming more and more of a big business because those guys have 30 years of experience and they know where the watches are. So when you come to them and you say, I'm looking for that very rare 1518 from King Farouk, they will know where that watch is. They will go to the guy who owns the 1518 King Farouk and they will ask him if he wants to sell the watch and they will make money out of this. And, and I think we're getting more and more into this where those guys know where the good stuff is and will try to sell you if you ask them, please, I'm looking for that. So that about concludes the uh, presentation today. Um, I'd like to know if there's any questions. Uh, wow, one, go ahead. One, two, two, two. On your, uh, on your, uh, Am I, I'm sorry? I'm sorry, on your chart of the evolution from 97 yes. to 16. So obviously something's happening there. Uh, three questions, or a question with three This parts. one, huh? A question, yeah, yeah, question with three parts. Uh, what, was the, what was the story in terms of product and buyers when Antiquarian was owning it in I mean, here? Is 2002, here. right? Then there's a transition period, and then, and then Phillips comes in and in two years slams the market. So there have to be changes in product that's being sold. Absolutely, yeah. You know, were they selling Brugues mm -hmm. in, in the beginning and now they're selling Pateks? And there have to be changes in the kind of buyers for Christie's to do that. They, yeah. They, um, so the product, 
the product changed a lot, uh, and it changed around 2006. They went, uh, the auction business was 85, 80, 85% pocket watches till about 10 years ago. Um, and when it was wristwatches, it was Patek. Rolex was a nothing business. There was a slide that I want to show you where it's a Christie's catalog from South Kensington, which is that cheap sale, where you have 10 Rolex for sale on one page. Uh, and those 10 Rolex were, had a combined estimate of about 10,000 pounds. And today, each of those watch is 150,000 um, pounds. The business changed because of this, because right here, the high-end stuff is pocket watches. People want pocket watch. In 2002, in this cell, Lord, uh, I don't remember the name, he's the former chairman of HSBC. He had not one pocket watch. It was bird clocks, it was a musical box, it was pocket watches, it was uh, enamel watches for the Chinese. And, and this changed uh, around 2008 when another thing happened, is the Chinese buyer showed up. Chinese buyer still continue buying pocket watches, but also bought modern wrist watches, and the Rolex business came in. The Rolex was not with the Chinese, but the Rolex business came in about the same time and improved the numbers for um, uh, wrist watches. Wrist watches is a much easier business than, than pocket watches for a few reasons. The business of pocket watches is dying because it's less and less collectors, um, and the knowledge is not passing on to the experts. You, Every day we're losing watch experts in the pocket watch business um, because there's no business. Uh, and people entering the business are in the wristwatch business. Second thing is for auction house, it's a much easier business. Try to ship a clock, you see how complicated it is. Uh, shipping a wristwatch is, is pretty, pretty simple. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right, that was a very good question. So this is where the, the change of merchandising and of clientele happened in, in the mid 2000s. Um, there was also political turmoil and anti crime in 2008, 2007, and that affected uh, and, uh, and, and made it easier for Christie's to, to get business. Yes, sir, all the way in the back. Sorry, I saw you first. So how much of the, <clears throat> of the sort of gain in Phillips is from the only watch auction, which obviously had spectacular results last year, but... Um, in terms of those gains in market share? It wasn't counted in that, huh? Yeah, uh, so they did not include those numbers. So when, this is what happened. Um, I had the numbers. And then yesterday I freaked out. I was like, I have numbers, but I don't know how good those numbers are. So what I did is I redid all the numbers. I printed out every 2016, uh, um, press release from every auction house where they have the results, right? And I counted the lots and I counted the numbers. Uh, and the number here doesn't show Philips uh, only watch. If you add Philips only watch, it's another 20 mil right there. Yeah, yeah. And now Philips, um, Philips is like it, it, it's it, it's a huge, very big. Uh, for a guy like me, it's very difficult to swallow. It's like Las Vegas has a new franchise, and they win the Super Bowl every year. Sure, they took, they took the best players, but they crush everybody. It's not even, there's not even a competition here. It's like they're crushing everybody. Uh, and in this case, there's no only watch numbers, yeah? Any other question? Any yes. questions? Well, hold on, I'll bring the mic to you. Uh, aside from some of the obvious things, like being able to see the condition, can you speak to some of the pitfalls of having to bid remote in terms of customs, getting the product, paying for it, that sort of thing, but aside from seeing the watch in the flesh and currency exchanges? Um, there's one question you should never ask an auctioneer. Actually, you should never ask a watch dealer uh, whether an auctioneer or not, is has it been polished? If you tell somebody, has the watch been polished, you're basically telling him, I don't know anything about watches. So never ask that question. Because you saw the unicorn, unpolished watch are even rarer than a unicorn. That's, by the way, a general um, tip I want to give you. But to come back to you, what are the pitfalls? The, the, the difficulties here is the C test with the strap. If you buy a watch overseas, forget the strap. 
think that they should throw the straps in the garbage. You should consider that the, the, strap, the, the leather strap is a goner. That's the one thing. Because it's too complicated to import a strap in the US, or anywhere in the world for that matter. That's the number one thing. The number th second thing is you have to become an expert on VAT issue and import issues. And this is where things get really complicated. Um, auction house have, an ex have experience with this. Auction house, obviously, you won't be the first New Yorker buying a watch in Geneva. So they do have experience shipping you the watch, but you will be hit with, uh, with uh, taxes. And it really depends how they, how they declare the value of the watch. And it's not so much about if they lie or not, it's the way they declared it. Did they put the value of the movement? And it, we, we, it goes on a case per case basis, basically. But usually you should ask those questions prior to doing the bidding, by sending an email. And they know, I mean, they're experienced in this. Um, it's not always the expert that knows this at an auction house. It's what they call client servicing. Client services will help you with this more in the shipping department more than the experts. Experts are there to really sell you the watch, but client service is there to uh, make sure that the watch gets to you and gets packed correctly and, and things like this. Yes, sir. Uh, with the softness in the um, retail market these days, what are the implications for 2017 and 2018 for the auction market, do you think? Um, we're going back a bit to the unicorn in the sense that because they're hyping so much the stuff is how much can they hype? You know, it's, it's like the Monte Carlo simulation. It's like every time they put every ship on the same color, hoping that they're going to win again, uh, is how many watches are out there how many of those can they hype? And what kind of result would they have? Um, and, and that's the, the, the major. The major problem is they don't have enough merchandise, but they need to increase their revenue shares. So with the same stuff, they need to have bigger numbers. Uh, and with that, it means you have to hype the stuff. But meantime, the big problem, the big challenge is the underlying modern watch business is not doing very well. It's going down. So it was easy to hype stuff in correlation to a, a model that was going up. If Patek was being hyped in general, it was easier to hype Patek at an auction. Now, if Patek goes down, it's much harder to hype Patek. Uh, the whole watch as investment is starting to look bizarre to people. I mean, five years ago, they would all tell you, watch is the best investment, look at Patek. And, and, and Patek will feed on the auction house, and the auction house will feed on Patek. It was a two-head business. And now that one head is going down, it's kind of hard for the other one to stay afloat. Um, I think that this is where they realize that the, the real scholarship has to happen. This is where it, the, the, the easy part is, is, is a goner. The, the easy part of selling a watch and telling you it's a great investment is, uh, is going to be gone. They, there's an auction house um, last year in, uh, in New York that sold a modern watch. And the, the watch didn't sell. They, it, it, but if you read in the catalog, uh, it was a modern watch and it was a rare watch. It, in the catalog, in black and white, it said, this watch is going to be a big investment in the future. And I thought that was the most shocking thing in the world, because you need a Series 7 to say something like this. You need, you need, to, you need to go and, and take exam with the SEC in order to do stuff like this. And the fact that an auction house, an established auction house, put on black and white that that watch was going to be a big investment was shocking to me. Uh, the watch didn't sell, and it was way overpriced. The, the reserve was at 200000 It's a $120,000 watch. And I really thought of going to the auctioneer and telling him, this is, this is not the way of doing business. But, you know. You cannot do that. And I'm very happy that the watch didn't sell, because I thought that was a gross exaggeration of where the business is going. But they're learning. They, they realize that they're doing this. They realize that it's burning. It, it burns them to, uh, to do this. They do. Yes? Is this a Hold on. cash business, or do people come with financing and is that available even through the auction houses? Ah, OK. I thought, uh, for a second, I thought you were, uh, you were asking me if you can come with. Uh, yeah, so um, they, Anticorum, when I was running, when I was the CEO of Anticorum, uh, we looked, in 2007, we, we had somebody that came in, a bank, and said, hey, I'm going to finance this stuff. You, you buy a watch, and we'll finance this. Uh, and six months later, 2008 happened, and this, is, this, was, this was done. Um, auction house do give um, advance to sellers. 
uh, they will give you money if you give them uh, uh, watches to, to, to take in consignment. Um, a famous case is the, the case of the, of the grave. Um, remember the, pocket, the grave that Sotheby's sold? Sotheby's had the grave. They also had a very important uh, brigade clock. And they had a collection of titanium wristwatches from Patek Philippe. They had um, a sky moon, I think, uh, and a couple of watches. And all of this was, uh, uh, they had lent money to somebody, and they had these watches, and he never paid them back. So they took that and they sold it at auction. That's why the grave went back on the block. It's because uh, that person failed to repay his loan. So they will advance your money, but on the seller side, not on the buyer. They will not, they, they are line of credit. They're buyers, they're dealers, they have line of credit, but it's, it, it, they won't do that with you. They won't do that with the private individuals. They will do that with important dealers. And those lines of credit usually um, are closed right away if there's an issue whatsoever, the, the smallest, or with the market in general, the watch market, or with that dealer in particular. Yes. Once you're in the auction room, are there any tactics that you would either recommend or have seen that are, are, are useful in, in order to get a watch at the best possible price? Either I, waiting, any tactics? Yes. Yeah, so waiting for the bid to come low and then going um, in, or shouting out the price as you Okay. Said so the shouting out the price is good uh, anywhere but in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, if you uh, shout out the price and you happen to be a Caucasian male. You just gave a 30% increase to that watch. Uh, it's a fact. I'm sorry to say that. But if, if you have me in the room dressed like I am with a paddle and a, doing a bid, and I go 20,000 and the watch is at 10,000, all of a sudden the watch is at 40,000. It's kind of a, a known thing. At least it was until maybe three years ago. Um, it's, there's, they, and people do that. There's a lot of things like this the dealers done, and auctioneers hate that, obviously. And this is the best way to get kicked out of auction. Um, now, on getting the watch at the lowest price, I'm, uh, before being in the watch business, I consider myself a student of investment. And I will say that the market is never wrong, that the market is always right. Even if you get out of it, you thought that the watch was too cheap or too expensive. It is what it is. Um, short of telling people that the watch is a fake, and you have a lot of that too. You have a lot of guys who tell you, who says to everybody, the watch is a fake, and the auctioneer hears that, knows it's not. And then, of course, the guy who was screaming this to all the auctioneers is the guy who's buying the watch. Um, but this is getting less and less. You have less and less of that business. You have, uh, you have enough intelligence in the room today because of, because of what we're doing tonight, for example, because of books, because of the internet. There's enough intelligence in the room that you're going to pay fairly the, the right market. The, the way you can steal something is basically if you buy the horse, you know, that American thoroughbred, you recognized that he was, um, uh, that he was the... Um, uh, the American Faro and nobody else does, and you buy it and then you promote it. And this happens still today. You have guys that buy stuff and we don't know what it is. And all of a sudden it's, prom it's promoted differently. Um, it has happened to me, I've done that. Uh, it has happened to others, uh, but it's less and less because of what's out there. And Google, Google is the worst thing that can happen to a, to a watch collector. Let's have uh, maybe one or two more questions. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah Jeff. By the way, this is great, William. Thank you. Thank you. Um, something I've seen being done by actually auctioneers that go to another auction house and um, will bid during an auction for a watch for a client or for themselves is sometimes they'll, they'll slow down the bidding. They'll, they'll wait for other people to bid, and they don't want to accelerate. They don't want to sort of get into the hype. Or they'll, they'll ask the auctioneer to sort of do a half bid. Or, do those things help at all in yeah. keeping the pricing a little bit lower? Yeah, um, it's the eBay tactics. Uh, you know you have sniper tools. Uh, if you want to bid on eBay, I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. You pay a fee, a dollar or two, you put the item number, and the sniper will go and bid on that 
uh, whatever you're bidding on on eBay at the last minute. That's why sometimes you have something you put on eBay and there's no bid for like the seven days and on the eighth day, the last hour, everybody's. Uh, and the same exists in, 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 uh, in the live auction. You know, there's a lot of different type of auction. The French did one called the candle auction, where there'd be a candle burning and when the candle is gone, it's the end of the auction. So sniping is a little bit, uh, was really good at the time because you knew when the candle and people start. But in, in, the, in, in the British system of auctioneer, the auctioneer is in charge. I'm the auctioneer, I'm in charge. I will be here, I will decide on the increments. And this is something that is important. It's very good that you, I didn't mention that today. I didn't talk about the auctioneer. There's a couple of things about the auctioneer. The guy is in charge. It's his room. He's gonna do whatever he wants. Like, I can do it now. I'm in charge of the room right now. You're all looking at me and, and it's the same thing for an auctioneer. He decides the bid increment. He decides if he wants to accelerate or if he wants to slow down the auction. The auctioneer is in charge, and the auctioneers know how to play a role. We didn't go about this factor, the, the man factor of the auctioneer, and a lot of people dismiss it, but it's a very good, um, a very important factor. And actually, that's one of the reasons I always recommend people to come early. You want to observe the auctioneer. You want to see how the guy behaves. Watching Aurel Bax doing an auction is a lesson in auctioneering. He knows how to accelerate, he knows who to look at, he knows how to push people in the room, and that helps. Um, now, if you're the bidder, and you have obviously certain tools in your favor also, you can half bid, you can scream a bid, you can half bid, you're also in charge. The auctioneer is your friend. He, he, doesn't want to, he definitely doesn't want to mock you. He doesn't, want, he doesn't want to make an enemy of you because if he makes an enemy of you, he makes an enemy of the entire room. Nobody's going to like him. Everybody's going to distrust him. So you working with him is to his advantage too. He wants to bring you as a client. He wants to bring your bid. Now, uh, I, mostly in my brief career as an auctioneer, I was auctioneering in Switzerland a lot. Uh, and we switch from French to English. Uh, and what we do is we, we have techniques where we know that, and because there's a phone and there's an internet, so we know who is gonna exhaust whom. Usually the room exhausts itself right away, then comes the internet bids, and then comes the phone. The guy on the phone is always the last one to bid. Why? Because they wanna know what's going on in the room. Nobody in the room is bidding. Huh, that must be a problem with that watch. Because those guys, they saw the watch. I didn't. I'm on the phone. I didn't see the watch. The guys on internet is the same thing. They haven't seen the watch. So if the room is not bidding, that can be a problem for an auctioneer. And this is what the auctioneer has to bring the watch to the reserve by bidding. You know, you, can, you have to bid. In, we didn't talk about that either. But we have to bid in behalf of the house up to the reserve. So if the reserve is $10,000 and I start at 6,000, I can bid and I can be bluffing you up to 10,000. And I'm allowed, that's absolutely legal. I can tell you I have bids for 8,000, but it's not true. So I will go fishing. I will say I have a bid for 6,000. My reserve is at 10, you don't know that, I know that. And I will ask for you guys to bid. And this helps me for a lot of things. This helps me for the telephone bids, for the internet bids. The fishing in the room is very important for an auctioneer. Uh, so slowing down, like Aurel, and I'm sure you're talking about Aurel bidding on the, uh, so he did this for two reasons. He did this because A, you want to, um, when you know what you're doing, you want to get the irrationality out. And this is why I was saying at the beginning, professional bidders, they hate the irrational. We want, and that's why I buy a very little watches at auction. It's very rational today. And we want rationality. We want people that know what they're doing. So when the, the fury is gone, you can calmly bid up to what you want to bid or your client wants to bid. So Aurel obviously as a, is as good as a bidder as he's an auctioneer. Uh, and I watched him do that. And I, um, two years earlier, you had um, somebody from Christie's that came to bid on the grave. Jean, who was it who came? Uh, Sabina, yeah, Sabina came to bid, and Sabina did the same thing with the uh, grave watch. She was very calm and very quiet and very collected about it. Auction people, when they bid, are usually collected because we do it on the phone all the time, we have clients. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a calmness to it that uh, we're used to it. Um, uh, uh, somebody from the public, you have your heart pounding, and what if he doesn't see me, and I really want that watch, which uh, somebody, professional one half. 
But yes, bidding, and there's also, uh, talking about techniques, there's a lot of people who like to bid at the last second. Um, I don't like it because auctioneers are not crazy about this because you have, let's say, two people fighting against each other on a watch for the last 10 minutes. And then you come in the middle and you draw a bid. You're kind of getting into in the middle of a fight and we have no idea what your um, motivation are because we didn't see you before. So auctioneers, they like to have, they will keep you apart, they will say, hold on, it's between those two guys, I get back to you later. And then they will come back to you and say, let's say one guy won, I will turn and look at you and see if you're willing to bid and then you can bid if you're still in the game. But usually, I always recommend to people, if there's a fight between two guys, don't get in the middle of the fight. Let those two guys fight each other, and then if it's still within your range, then go in the fight, because the guy who just won is exhausted, and you're not. Um, so then you can really go and, and go for the kill in that case, if it's, um, uh, if it's, after, um, if it's still within the, the range that you want to pay. So yes, that's the technique. I'm not crazy about technique because it's like if you're going to a real fight and the guy's telling you you're going to punch him on this side and that side, it never happens that way. Uh, but when you bid a lot and a lot, yes, there are things you never get in a fight between two guys. Let them fight each other. Then you pick up on the winner. What else? We have time for one more question. All right, right here. For pieces that aren't particularly rare and maybe at the lower end of the auction spectrum, do you think that there's a, a better or worse uh, odds of getting a good price on that piece at an auction or going through a dealer and buying on the used market? What price range? Can you give me an idea? Or 10 to 15. Um, I, I, I'm assuming vintage. Um, Honestly, I will go to a dealer. Uh, I will go to a dealer for one simple reason, is after, mark, uh, af after the purchase, you have better service from a dealer than from an auctioneer. Uh, especially when we went through those numbers. I mean, if you look at a $15,000 watch in, uh, let's say, in New York, besides Anticorum, you are gonna have a hard time at Christie's really making a mark here if you have a problem with the watch. You kind of a pain in the neck for them. Uh, if you're not a known entity, if you're just starting, you're a $15,000 guy. I'm a $15,000 guy at Christie's. But I buy my watch, I pay and I leave. I don't bother them. I criticize the catalog, I criticize the watches, but I don't tell them that the watch I got is not working properly. Um, but um, a dealer, yeah, because he thinks you might be buying a $20,000 watch tomorrow. So he might be able to help you. And, the, the, the team at auction is moving to the next watch. They're looking for the next kill. Uh, the after service is not very good. I will start playing with auction house when they are above, at or above those averages right here. This is where I think you have better service. This is where I think that you have a better chance creating a relationship with them. Uh, it's a sad fact, but uh, at the end of the day, this is why I think it's, it's, it's best. They won't tell you this. They tell you they want the business from a thou thousand bucks. But the, 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 the truth of the matter is this is where the, the gravy is for them. This is where they want to serve you better. All right, let's, let's give William a hand. Thank, Thank you, you, William. <laughs>